access to the HOV lanes? Super. All you need to do is buy a new car. Republicans are pitching a fit in the state legislature because they don't have the votes to stop anything. Former Governor Hickenlooper's national town hall was a real mess, as in a very genuine mess. An update on the mystery shipment headed for Colorado, the one that police in Oklahoma think was a ton of marijuana. And Coloradans can't wait to get out boating this spring. But slow your roll. The lakes are still on ice. Next. There is a late night infomercial vibe going on at the state capitol. Democratic lawmakers are trying to sell their version of the sham wow. How would you like to bypass traffic, drive free in the HOV lanes, get a discount in the express lanes? Terms and exclusions apply for that. Here's Marshall Zellinger. What if I told you you can ride free in the HOV lanes without three people in your car? Now what if I told you you'd have to buy an electric vehicle to get the benefit? We hear the pushback that electric vehicles get a lot of benefits that uh, other vehicles don't. Democratic Representative Alex Valdez is one of a few lawmakers who drives an electric vehicle. I found more than a half dozen walking around their parking lot today. He's sponsoring a bill that for a fee of $35 gives electric vehicle owners free access to HOV lanes and half off express lanes, including the I-70 Mountain Express lanes that can cost other drivers up to 40 bucks. Uh, it has kind of two benefits benefits to uh, incentivize people to use cars that don't pollute and to help people that do to know that they don't have to have that dreaded range anxiety. Range anxiety, meaning the feeling of your electric vehicle running out of electricity. Not to be mistaken for the rest of the people stuck on I-70, worried they'll run out of fuel. In order to incentivize widespread adoption of electric vehicles, this provides an incentive. CDOT's director of the state's toll lanes figures the fee electric vehicle owners have to pay up front will make up for the discount they'll get. Even use of the high occupancy vehicle lanes for free even when they're not alone. We want to put more people on the road, but in fewer cars, and that's where our HOV program comes in. This electric vehicle policy is all about uh, trying to electrify more vehicles and reduce carbon emissions. So I don't think the two are mutually exclusive. I whiz by traffic quietly, quickly. Remember how I said Valdez is one of the lawmakers with an electric car? I know what you're thinking. So I asked him about passing a bill to save himself some money. I won't because there's no lanes that I would use in between here and my house. It's a bit of a cop. He lives downtown. He doesn't have to enter. Uh, Valdez also told me there's a misconception that electric vehicle owners don't pay gas taxes. They don't, but they do pay a $50 annual fee when they register their car. In comparison to other states, Kyle, spoiler alert, we are the cheapest. You will hear that argument a lot. that They're not paying for the roads. They're paying something. And this is in line with Governor Jared Polis's idea of energy. Like, I'm not going to force you to do something, but here's a carrot on the stick to get you to do it. Here's a fee on a stick. All right. Thank you, Marshall. You got to admire Colorado Republicans bravado. They got their butts handed to them in historic fashion in November's election. That's just a, a fact. Don't email me about that. It happened, okay? Uh, Democrats, they have not held this much power in state government since before World War II. But it's the Republicans who are making demands down at the state capitol. They are demanding concessions, or they say they will keep dragging out every procedural issue possible. Pretty brave, huh? What they're actually doing is making this poor Senate staffer read bills aloud for hours at a time to slow down the process. 52101 short title. The short title of this Article 20 is the... Colorado Student Loan Servicers Act, 52102, scope of the article. This article only applies to any person engaged in servicing. So Republicans think they're sticking it to Democrats. They're really just sticking it to that guy named Andrew Carpenter who has to chew through bill after bill out loud, more than an hour's worth of reading today alone. Republican Senator Owen Hill of Colorado Springs actually seemed kind of apologetic that they're playing this game. I said, Andrew, thanks for doing this. Thanks for uh, thanks for stepping up to the plate and helping us with this whole process. I brought some water and do you want coffee? Do you want tea? Anything you want, man. If someone doesn't want to do something, the only way to get them to see that and hear the voice of the people of Colorado is to create tension. So I understand we're creating tension. Senate Republicans are vowing to keep stalling, creating tension until Democrats adjust their oil and gas regulations in order to make it easier for Colorado voters to overturn those new rules. And Republicans want more. They also want the red flag gun control bill changed so that instead of seizing guns from somebody who's deemed a threat, the guns would stay in their natural habitat and the person would be taken to a hospital. 
If I'm going to ding former Governor John Hickenlooper when he changes positions in his run for president, like his odd refusal to admit that he's a capitalist, well, then I ought to give him credit when he is consistent. Hickenlooper's much mocked town hall on CNN last night was 100% the guy that Colorado knows and some love. He was practical, yet long-winded to the point of sounding evasive. He avoided memorable one-liners, for better or for worse. And he didn't make bold policy pronouncements, for better or for worse. He was charmingly self-deprecating on CNN. And he was clumsily cringeworthy. He was, in short, the real John Hickenlooper. So now we get to see what America thinks of that. It's too early to write off Hickenlooper, even when he's polling somewhere between 0 and 1% in the Democratic presidential primary. But the thing is, he is up against the Democrats' best and brightest. You can't forget, he was elected governor in this state because he beat a Republican who thought that bike shares were a United Nations conspiracy and a third-party candidate who suggested bombing Mecca. So let's wait and see whether the real John Hickenlooper, who stood up and tripped up last night on CNN, can actually stay in the running. Prosecutors are backing off their plans to throw the book at everyone involved in bringing a truckload of hemp through Oklahoma headed for Colorado. Police down there in Oklahoma still insist it's not hemp, it's marijuana. That would make that truck full one of the biggest pot busts in American history. Here's Anusha Roy with an update. I talked to the lawyers for the two truck drivers who said the DA out of Osage County indicated the charges against the truck drivers could be dropped in court tomorrow. So we're talking about 33 year old Farah Warsami from Ohio and 51 year old Tadesi Daniki from Alabama. They were in jail for around 27 days facing aggravated drug trafficking charges. Now in January, they were driving through Pahuska while being escorted by Patriot Shield, a veteran run security company. They were on their way to make a delivery in Colorado when the group got in trouble for running a red light. That is when officers thought they were transporting thousands of pounds of marijuana through the state. The security company is adamant, however, it's hemp, which was legalized under federal law in December. But federal lab testing showed three out of the 11 samples were testing too high for THC. That cutoff is 0.3%. Now, the lawyers for the truck drivers don't want to speculate, but they say the drivers were just given instructions to pick up the load like any other job and shouldn't get in trouble for this. It does, however, look like the case against the Patriot Shield guys, including a man from Aurora, is moving forward and they've got a court date tomorrow as well. So nothing is set in stone, obviously, until the court hearing, but the truck drivers actually chose to go back to Oklahoma for court, saying it was their civic duty. Kyle. The prosecutors in Osage County, Oklahoma, would only say to us today that case is set for tomorrow. We promise to keep you updated. Denver's tiny club of cannabis businesses, social cannabis businesses, will soon be back up to two of them. So you got the original, the coffee joint, where you can use cannabis and drink coffee. That was the original. That stayed open the whole time. And pretty soon, the recently closed Vape and Play is going to spark up again. Vape and Play closed last month. It was only in business for a month's time. And we learned this week it's going to reopen in early April as Dean Ween's Honey Pot Lounge at Vape and Play. They're going to add nightly events, concerts, movie, comedies. They'll also have a bong library. A bong library. Denver's Excise and License Department says Vape and Play's non-transferable social cannabis license, just one of two, as we said, remains valid because they never sold the business. They're just changing it. Looks like they hired Honeypot as a management consultant. So one of our first shared obsessions here on Next, dating back two years or so, Colorado license plates. So when a viewer named Robert saw that his wife's newly issued license plates were different, he let us know. Sure enough, Robert was right. He noticed that Colorado's license plates now have four letters and two numbers. That's a change from what was a three letter, three number combination. Remember, we're always looking for cues everywhere. The DMV says they changed this about a year ago because they ran out of different combinations with the old system. Nearly two million plates use that old combination. Now that we are at four and two, they estimate they're going to get at least 15 to 18 years before they have to change the combo again. Law enforcement from across Colorado gathered today to honor Colorado State Patrol Corporal Dan Groves. Groves was hit and killed along I-76 near Roggen while helping a driver during last week's blizzard. Groves was truly dedicated to service early on. His field training officer knew it. 
I know that Dan realized what the conditions were like out on I-76 that day, but he knew that people were going to be getting stranded and that that highway was going to be getting closed. So he went. He went out that day to save a life. Dan always went. All you had to do was ask, and before you even finished asking, Dan was asking, where do you need me to be? That was Dan. Dan loved this job. He loved serving people. Absolutely loved it. So from me to Dan, you will truly, truly be missed, my brother. And we will take it from here. The diorama is a very impressive piece, if only because of its sheer size. A miniature version of Denver as it looked in the 1860s. It's the work of an East High grad during the Great Depression. And the state's gonna need you to hold off on those boating plans for obvious reasons. And people who don't know how to Colorado are wrecking a special part of our state. Next. A woman in Frederick saw a news story about a lady in Paradise, California, you know, where that recent wildfire burned, the place where that woman's jewelry melted in the fire, and that Coloradan watching the story knew what she could do to help. Our Katie Eastman has the story. I love the pink gems and the blue gems. I love London blue topaz. A world of sparkle um, and color. I love it all. I don't discriminate. That's the all. one Stacia Shane <laughs> Clark wants everyone to live in. I've been making jewelry for 20 plus years. Everything's made in sterling silver and either Swarovski crystal or precious gemstones. Each piece is requested. It's just a little something. Something that sparkles. It is the photo that I have used to inspire this entire project. For a world turned black and white. I'm creating jewelry for the survivors of the campfire. I can't give someone a house. I can't give someone a car. I can't give them a job. I'm not close enough to help them with anything like that. And this is so, um, so silly. The offer wasn't silly to the people from Paradise. I saw your post about campfire survivors losing Three their boys, jewelry and we lost I everything in the fire. Jewelry, you are so sweet. But I lost my grandmother's point. pearls. Every request comes with a story. I love jewelry and I lost all in the fire. Heartbreak that makes her fingers go faster. Yeah, it does. It does. She knows their worlds need so much more than something silver. So it's a three pearl necklace. But if this something brings a smile, 
Well, that's the world Stacia wants to help bring back. So now I'm going to fill those jewelry boxes and make sure everybody has something that makes them sparkle when they go out. In Frederick, Katie Eastman, 9 News. Perfect. Kind woman. May I make a recommendation that you check out something from our meteorologist friend and superhero, Becky Ditchfield. Perhaps you noticed as Becky was working long hours nailing her bomb cyclone forecast that she's also working on a more personal project. She's growing a human inside of her. Nasty emailers noticed this as well, and they complained that Becky's stomach stuck out two miles, blocking that weather map in the backyard. Well, Becky slayed them with science and math, figuring out precisely how much of the weather map is covered by her baby bump in both inches and miles. If you're on Team Becky, you're going to love reading this, and we have a link on the next Facebook page. Windy, warm today in spite of the cloud cover. Temperatures near 60 degrees in the city. And you know what? The average is 56. We're finally running above that number, but it's all about to change with another storm already moving into southern Colorado. The snow's already flying in the high country. Winter weather and travel advisories out for the southern mountains. The low will slide into southeastern Colorado, but it's a warm storm, a fast moving storm, so it'll be more of a rain than snow event for lower elevations. Rain and snow will pick up across the continental divide and across the western slope. Tonight, a wave may bring an isolated shower to Denver, more widespread rain tomorrow, and then a brief rain snow mix tomorrow night. We'll have less than an inch of accumulation on the grass by Saturday morning. Tonight, nice above freezing under cloudy skies. Tomorrow, a mix of clouds and sunshine, afternoon rain and evening rain snow mix. We clear out on Saturday, have another shower come in Sunday night, and then highs near 70 degrees by the middle to the end of next week, Kyle. I like it. Thank you, Kathy. We are now in spring. You can tell that by the calendar and the changing temperatures in my Syracuse orange jacket. It's not salmon. Hey, speaking of the fishes, don't rush back onto Colorado's lakes and reservoirs. They are not ready for us yet, especially not Vega Reservoir. Senior park ranger out there says they've been getting a lot of calls from people wondering what the boating forecast looks like. Well, there it is, folks. That is no forecast for boating. The lake is still covered in snow and ice. Rangers say there's three to four feet of snow out there, 20 inches of ice beneath. The mesa above the lake is still layered in about eight feet of snow. So they're asking people to wait weeks before trying to come out. Last year with the drought year, we were at middle of April when we actually opened the boating. This year with as much snow and ice as we still have, depending on obviously weather for the rest of March and into April, we may be looking at a little bit later opening this year. But that's as and a half, Spry says Vegas State Park's aiming to open the reservoir May 1st. A new look at a very old view of Denver. And now all this UV coated glass is clear and you can see incredible detail that you just haven't been able to see since it was in the old building. Somebody had a lot of time on their hands during the Great Depression. That's next.
Time for another reminder. That's not how you Colorado. Jeffco has closed some popular open space trails to keep them from being torn up in the muddy season. And as you can tell there, people are going around the closures and they're doing some real damage to those trails. 19 people have received tickets so far this season, $150 a pop. And there's not a whole lot of detective work involved with finding people on closed trails each day. Typically, those would be the only cars at those closed trailheads. And rangers say you do also leave very convenient fresh tracks in the mud. Denver was a very different and dusty place in 1860, and we can see that thanks to Eunice Welch. Family says she was an adventurous woman, lifelong learner, passionate about the outdoors. She's the woman who sculpted and painted most of History Colorado's old Denver Diorama, a popular exhibit now reopened to the public in a new home. Denver in 1860 was a really wild place. In 1858, gold had been discovered, and in just two years, the town had sprouted to several thousand people. Denver did continue to develop over the next decades. The Great Depression happened in October of 1929, and like all other towns across America, Denver was hit. And during that time, there were several federal programs to help employ artists and craftsmen. And History Colorado was the first museum in the nation to use New Deal funds for historical projects. And the Denver Diorama was the first of those to use that money. The Diorama was built in 1934. The Diorama is a very impressive piece, if only because of its sheer size. The great thing was that this Diorama used local artists, including a woman named Eunice Welch. She was a Colorado native, graduated from Denver East High School. Eunice and her team of artists did original research. They found newspaper clippings, historical photographs. They even went out and did oral histories of pioneers who were still alive at the time. But in large part, this is indeed what Denver looked like in the 1860s. And it's exciting to see how people engage with the diorama today. The detail and the care that the artists chose to make really speaks to the testament of how history can, can really be engaging even today. That whole diorama, no ugly condos in the entire thing. Hmm, wonder when they came along. Your feedback tonight is a salmon run and also lots of love for Becky with the good glare. Next.
finish with your feedback, Jeff says, I can't tell if your jacket is several old lady purses sewn together or a portion of cheap hotel curtains, but it looks nice. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, you're not at all like Pauline and Jennifer and Addie and Jackie and Ashley and Michael and Chris and Cheryl, who all wrote in to say something nice about my salmon jacket. It's not. It's orange. There's a big Syracuse game tonight. Come on, get with it, people. Gary Ames knows there's an SU game tonight because he writes in and says, I always lose respect for you this time of year, but regain it. Rock chalk, a big win for Kansas today. And Tiffany says of Becky Ditchfield's commentary, people are awful, but Becky, you have a lot of class. Keep on cooking the tiny human. See you next time.